It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. There's two possible causal explanations. One is, in, in broad terms, that everything that we see arose through, the, through undirected material processes, some form of undirected evolutionary change. Another idea that's been held all the way back to the ancient Greeks is that there was a mind that was shaping the material processes, that there was some kind of intelligent design. Now, if you hold a methodological naturalism, you're going to exclude the design hypothesis by definition. You're not even going to consider it, whatever the evidence is. Right. But it might be the case that we have encountered certain kinds of evidences in biological systems that would, in any other context, lead us to conclude design. For example, one of the things we've discovered at the Foundation of Life, which I've written about in a couple of different books, is the digital code stored in the DNA. We know that digital code, software, always comes from a programmer. And so it, we might be tempted to consider the possibility that the information stored in DNA in a digital form is actually evidence of a master programmer for life. It would be like walking into the, the, uh, the British Museum, looking at the Rosetta Stone and saying, well, where did, where did all those interesting inscriptions come from? If we're holding to methodological naturalism, we're going to have to say, well, something like wind and erosion or some other mm -hmm. materialistic process, even though we know from experience that information of the kind inscribed on the Rosetta Stone always comes from a mind. So the problem with methodological naturalism is that it keeps us from following the evidence to wherever it leads, especially when we're looking at questions about origins or questions about the nature of the human mind, questions that have both a scientific and philosophical dimension to them. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about these topics, video games, science fiction, computer science, quantum physics, and mysticism. It's quite a bit to pack into an hour, and eh? we need to leave some time for Q&A. Now, you'll notice that I included two topics that sometimes aren't discussed by a lot of academics or scientists, which is science fiction and mysticism. But it turns out they're actually quite relevant and important when we talk about the simulation hypothesis. First, most of the references, references we have are from science fiction, like The Matrix. And that's really the question that we're going to be trying to answer today is, do we live in The Matrix? But also, we start to get into this question of what is consciousness? Uh, and it's something that science hasn't fully understood yet, but mystics have been studying it for thousands of years. So, although sometimes scientists get upset at me, why are you talking about mysticism and religion in the same breath as quantum physics? Uh, I did that deliberately. <laughs> Will we get to the point where the video game is indistinguishable from reality? I would argue we're actually getting there very quickly. But anyway, going all the way back to the atheists, is the atheists see that Jews, just like other believers, have a lifestyle connected to it. So, gee, maybe we're the same. And they see that we're very devoted. Gee, they, sound, they seem the same. Except the atheists and the Jews believe in the same God. And the God that the atheists don't believe in is the God that the believers believe in. Meaning the non-Jews. 
So in the end, the atheists and the Jews have everything in common. And I've proven it over and over and over again that, that before there was something, there was nothing is the God we're talking about. And the and I've had many atheists raise their hands and say, Rabbi, that's a God I could believe in because I always thought God was nothing. So that's right, we're on the same page. I sort of feel like I'm starting to get to the point where my whole perspective on Christian apologetics is so far from where it once was. This week I came across this guy, Stephen Meyer. So he's a biblical creationist guy, has like a PhD in philosophy of science, and been listening to a few of his uh, presentations and arguments. He's a big proponent of intelligent design and refuting things like theistic evolution and, you know, all those things which on the surface level, um, you know, I'd still definitely be in agreement with and think are, are important points to establish to a degree, but, you know, it's not even just that he's just like so many others still trying to argue from the, the basis of, of a Copernican expanding universe, you know, with space and gravity and everything, but it's more than that. It's so much more than that now, and I've had a few people recently asking, like, why aren't you talking about cosmology as much, or, or flat earth, and part of me is going, well, I feel like I've been talking about it non-stop. You know, it's sort of indirectly, but this whole broader question of the relationship between faith and Christian apologetics and, and science, appealing to science as something to try and convince people of the veracity of the Bible. Um, the more I just look back on, on the whole progression of all these ideas and arguments and debates and throughout church history, so much of it just seems kind of missing the point or, or, or just was fixating on some minute thing and, and missing the whole bigger picture. Not being able to see the forest for the trees. And it could be something as simple as like, you know, arguing from Copernican cosmology and, and the expanding universe and convincing yourself that you're not actually trying to use evolution-based models to deny evolution. You know, this whole self-contradiction that they can't bring themselves to, to recognize. But even something like just as basic as, as intelligent design, thinking that it's some kind of intellectual victory if you can convince people that there's design in the cosmos. And he's talking about DNA and, and you know, and how everything's like software. And it's, it's information at the base of, uh, of everything. And, and yeah, so it just, it kind of struck me, right? Because I had come across this, this Rizwan, whatever his name is. This guy giving a Google talk, talking about his book on the simulation theory, simulation hypothesis, and yeah, video games and mysticism and AI. It's a fascinating, I mean, I could talk Oh, just about that whole presentation, but it's kind of nothing really new to unpack there. But it is all being combined, right, in kind of one increasingly cohesive narrative on that side, and that's the side that you just, it's like the Christian apologetics, the Christian creationist world is still in their minds battling against R Richard Dawkins and the new atheists and secular humanism and scientific materialism and all these things, which are definitely in the world, but if secular humanism was really the agenda that Satan was trying to establish in the world as the monolithic belief system, then he's, he has horribly failed because it has come back to mysticism. Just like, um, it blew me away listening to, to Rabbi Glaser, my favorite Kabbalistic rabbi professor. He's openly talking about how, like, yeah, the atheists believe in the same God we do. The same God that is nothing, even though it's the same. He'll turn around and talk about God as a being, and God as a person, and God thinks this, and God thinks that, and you know, he has all these personal traits and and things. But we, at the same time, we can't know anything about him, and he's he's nothing. If you try and put him in a box, and you're making him too small, and that's not God. So God is nothing. I mean, it's just contrived horse crap, you know. And it's obvious when you're looking at it from the outside in, but overall it just shows me that, yeah, the, you know, the whole idea of just trying to convince people that there, there's intelligent design in the universe and it's not random. I mean, everybody knows it's not random. 
it's just a it's a self delusion and that's the thing the whole reason that simulation theory is gaining such a acceptance more and more is because people instinctively know that there's design in the world not just in the the heavens and the or the motions of the the planets and the stars and all these calculations that you make but every morning when you open your eyes and you look around you you interact with the world and you think your thoughts and interact with other other human beings and have relationships and do all the things you you do everything has an order everything you expect when you see an object that it's going to behave the way that you know a stone is going to have the weight of a stone wood is going to split in half when you chop it with an axe and you know all these basic things it's not suddenly going to you know explode when you try and chop a piece of wood it's not random it's it's ordered it's designed it's this is not some profound thing that we only prove once we're able to like supposedly calculate the orbital motions of of stars and planets with telescopes I and mean, this is just it's just stupid it's playing this game this intellectual you know game where we where Christians somehow we, we, we want to claim science and we want to claim all these discoveries for ourselves and, and and use science to try and prove God and prove that the Bible is true and where where in the Bible does God ever ask us to do that where do you see the the apostles or the patriarchs ever trying to appeal to human wisdom and scientific knowledge, observational knowledge about mechanical, physical processes and properties in order to prove that God, that God, God revealed himself through a nation, through history, through prophets and kings and ordinary people. He didn't use philosophers and scientists and great minds. Romans 1, they're always trying to apply Romans 1 to like modern astronomy. The heavens declare the glory of God. Well, they were declaring the glory of God before freaking Galileo ever pointed a telescope at Jupiter and concluded that it had moons orbiting around it. I mean, that's just... They, everybody knows there's intelligent design. It's not something you gotta really prove. Because, I mean, here's the thing. When people don't want to surrender to the idea of, of a God who's, who's not nothing but actually a being, a person, a consciousness, not some impersonal, diffused, pantheistic consciousness, but like a real person, just like, just like we use in every other sense of the word when we're talking about a, a, be a personal being, an intelligent personal being. But if people don't want that kind of God, yeah, they can just as easily turn around and say that, oh, the whole world's a computer simulation running on a computer in the basement of an alien child or something. Because indeed, I mean, even Neil deGrasse Tyson is down with that kind of God. That kind of intelligent designer. He'll, he hates the term intelligent design when it's associated with biblical creation, but not if it's an alien computer simulation. What does that tell you? It just shows you that this whole idea that scientism is a religion is not hyperbole. It really is a religion. They believe in metaphysics. They believe in consciousness. They believe in the idea of higher intelligent beings. I just call them aliens or whatever. Like literally every concept that you could pull out of the Bible, they could, there's a, a science fiction alternative for. The world is just playing games with God and you know, instead of pointing to the gospel, pointing to the things that, you know, Jesus spoke about in his parables. Jesus spoke in parables. He, he wasn't... Now how many, how much cosmological insight and information and scientific revelation do you think Jesus could have expounded upon during his time on Earth with crowds of people? And, I mean, he could have wowed them with so much scientific knowledge. It would be science, right? Because he, if he's God, he doesn't have to discover it. But. But, so, the, the ironic thing is that in this one talk, Stephen Meyer, he's talking about the self-contradiction and the hypocrisy of the theistic evolutionists asking the question, where does your theism impact your evolution? Because you believe in all the same, all the same progression from the Big Bang all the way through Darwin and biological evolution, 
billions of years, and, you know, you ask them the question is, does God direct the evolution? And they, and they say, well, maybe, but maybe not. And so it's just God tacked on. And so he, he rightly poses the question, like, where does your, where does your theology actually connect with, with this evolution? Because they don't, obviously. So you just want to have well, your belief in God just tacked on to the end, even though it makes no sense. So he's rightly pointing out this this disconnect, this disingenuous, you know, spirituality. But the irony for me is that I think that's really essentially what even young earth creationism, even our biblical creationism and biblical apologetics that still adhere to a, a literal six-day creation and the earth being very young. You want to defend the idea that the Bible is history, that you know Noah's Ark and the Flood and all that really happened, and the parting of the Red Sea and Jesus rising from the dead, that was all true. And so you're trying to use modern science and astronomy and physics and whatever else to, to argue that the Bible is true with all these miraculous things. And people see the disconnect, right? In that it's you know somewhere in the past 2,000 years since all this supernatural intervention with the natural world was was going on and being recorded in these biblical books, we've progressed past that. So now we could just point to uh, oh, how much we know about all the design of these galaxies and black holes and all other junk that they it's all made up. But there's no supernatural element to any of it today. They've, they've pragmatically become just like the, the materialists. Making these like philosophical arguments, but really there's no concept of like, yeah, there's a spiritual dimension to reality when you read the Bible. And if the Bible is true, there's a spiritual reality, a spiritual dimension to reality now. And not just in the sense that there is a God who you can't see with your eyes, but he's everywhere. And not just in the sense that, yes, you are a consciousness, which means you're more than just neurons firing a bunch of mechanical processes, but you are a, a soul. You, there's a spiritual dimension to who you are, separate from your body, but interfaced with your physical body, somehow through the, the brain or wherever, however that works. There's an interface, there's an overlap. Who you are and your, your thoughts and your feelings and your innermost being are not a matter of biology. And deep down, people know this. You know, it's, it's a false front, it's a false flag, this materialistic science. Because even they don't hold to it. I mean, look at dark matter and dark energy. So they can give themselves an out anytime they want. They can sit and toss aside their materialism when it's convenient for them. But So why are we still trying to play according to these intellectual rules of academia that they don't even hold to. There's no there's no intellectual integrity to any of this. And you know, I'm not I'm not really trying to say anything just to pick on individuals or, or figures in you know, creationist camps or anything. It's, I'm just kind of speaking more in, in my, my general attitude, I guess, towards just the church. You know, the, the shrinking number of people who still hold to a somewhat sound biblical doctrine of salvation of the gospel who yeah it's like a simulation theory like what a bunch of nonsense right this is how many years are you gonna go by before these guys start taking this stuff seriously i don't know if ever but and obviously i don't take it seriously in the way it's presented but because it really is the same thing that the occult and the kabbalah have been teaching for a long long time and now just amazingly, it's just popping up in this whole new context, in this whole new paradigm of Silicon Valley and AI and, you know, virtual reality and science fiction and the Matrix. People today understand Kabbalah far better than they even know and than they ever have in history because it was super secretive for a long time. And now it is not. And now it is stuff like this, this mysticism that we call science, that is the prevailing worldview. But thanks to our 21st century advancements in computing and technology, we've been able to add an even more interesting question to the bunch. Do we live in a simulation? 
At first glance, this might seem like a silly thought, but there's actually plenty of reason to assume that we may well be sims in some advanced civilization science experiment. If you look at how our technology has progressed over the last 50 years or so, it's pretty shocking to see just how far we've come. 47 years ago, the world got its first taste of widely available video games with Pong. Cutting edge at the time, Pong consisted of two rectangles and a dot, which players could bounce from side to side. Fast forward to today, and we're getting close to photorealistic video games and seeing the rapid maturation of virtual and augmented reality devices. This explosion of technology has led some thinkers to believe that, at some point in the future, our descendants will have developed the capacity to run incredibly complex ancestor simulations, and that we may be living in one such program. If it is possible to run such a massively intricate simulation, then the odds of us being real biological entities are greatly diminished. Think of it like this. If these supercomputers do come to exist, then it would make sense to assume that there would be many such simulations running at various points in the future. As technology advances, say, a thousand years from now, it's increasingly likely that more powerful supercomputers could run hundreds or thousands or even millions of ancestor simulations simultaneously. If we accept this line of reasoning, then it would be foolish to assume that out of all the millions of simulated realities, we happen to live in the original biological one that hasn't yet developed the simulation technology. This is pretty strange to think about, but how exactly could we determine whether or not our reality is real? Now, how does God do it? How does God project us? The answer is he projects us by a parallel realms. This whole system is being created by parallel realms, just like this board is. There's light shining on the board, but if I put my hand and I create now a filter of that light. Now I've created this, an image. There's now an image created via the filter of my hand. Well, what if I, what if I made that filter more complex? Well, after a while, maybe it'd be, I don't know what it'd be. It'd be a, uh, I can't make anything creative out here with this angle, but you know, if it were another angle, maybe I can make a dog or a chicken or something. But, but the, uh, you understand that they, the more complex the filtering system, the more complex the image. Our entire world is a direct result of infinite light shining through parallel universes. Our entire existence is because of infinite light shining through parallel universes. Infinite light shining through parallel universes. That's how we're here. I've made some discoveries in my own personal life with the science that, you know, Pythagoras was searching for. I was able to open up the flower of life properly and find the real wave conjugations that we've been looking for for 10,000 years. Why would I continue, you know, walking on water for tips when I've got an entire generation to teach a whole new world? That, that's a big remark. Yeah. What, what, what do you intend to, to do? Well, let me put it this way. All energy in the universe is expressed in motion. All motion is expressed in waves. All waves are curved. So where does the straight lines come from to make the platonic solids? There are no straight lines. So when I took the flower of life and opened it properly, I found a whole new wave conjugation that exposed the in-between spaces. That's, it's the thing that holds us all together.
Science has taught us that stars are distant suns, and planets are distant worlds. Let's zoom into the planet Mars and see what it really looks like. Is it really a distant ball reflecting sunlight? Is this really a distant ball reflecting sunlight? They told us this was nearly a billion miles away and the ring was rocks and dust. Is this really reflecting sunlight? Stars we were told are distant suns. Is this what they look like to you? You'll notice that each of the stars have their own individual shapes, colors, and personalities.
They lied to us, guys.